I'd love to just hone in on some of the disorders that are really affecting society right now. And you can probably speak um, more about this than me, but what I'm seeing is a number of cases of ADHD, adult ADHD being diagnosed. I want to know more about that. And then we'll move into two others. And then what I'm really, really super interested in is the the overall pathophysiology, like what are, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the food having an effect on the mitochondria? Are we seeing downregulation of inflammatory biomarkers? Um, and then there's this whole question around the ketogenic diet um, and increasing LDL cholesterol, of course, and ApoB and how that might have an effect on cardiovascular disease risk. So I have so many questions, but let's talk about ADHD, because I got to tell you, it's a mystery to me. I I don't have it and I can't understand. You know, I, I have a very, very, very close girlfriend who just, she and she hasn't, she's been diagnosed and she's actually on Vyvanse, mm -hmm. I believe. And I just see, she, you know, sometimes her attention span, even when I'm talking to her, maybe she'll just switch. And, and I, I wish to God that we can help her. So help me to understand what, what, ADHD is and how nutrition plays a role in this. Great. So ADHD is is very common and uh, in children as well as in adults. And really, I think uh, so. So ADHD stands for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Some people just have the inattentive symptoms. They they their attention their attention is not properly regulated. Some people have hyperactivity symptoms. Um, those are those are the kids and adults who can't sit still, uh, restless, that sort of thing. Uh, feel like they're being driven by a motor. Some lots of phrases people use to describe this. And some people have a combination of the two: inattentive symptoms and hyperactivity symptoms. And so there's the, this is this is according to the DSM five that we we're talking about before the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I really don't like the term attention deficit disorder because, even though that's the correct term, because it really isn't a deficit in attention. I mean, I worked uh, in an ADHD specialty clinic for several years, the Hallowell Center outside Boston. Um, I worked in college mental health at Harvard University and later at Smith College for a total 12, 13 years, working with many students who had attention issues. It's not that these people cannot pay attention. It's that they cannot direct the attention where it needs to go, when it needs to go, therefore, as long as it needs to be there. So we all know people with ADHD who can focus uh, for hours on something that doesn't matter, <laughs> something that they don't have to get done that day, um, or something that intensely interests them. Uh, we all... I mean. It's not that they can't pay attention. They can't control where the attention is going when it needs to be there and for, for the long enough, a long enough period of time. So they, they do not, they cannot be effective in their lives. They can't, they, and, and, and ADHD can be actually be a very disabling disorder. Uh, in some cases, it can really interfere with people's ability to hold down a job, to hold down a relationship. Um, to to uh, get credentialed in whatever the field is that they wish to they, they wish to succeed in if they're following sort of a more academic or or um, vocational path. So people can't get things done that that matter. And, and this is really frustrating because it has nothing to do with intelligence. So you can be a very, very intelligent person and fail over and over again in your life. And th this mismatch between between potential and actual capability is very frustrating for people because they know that they could do it if they could just concentrate <laughs> and and not procrastinate. Is this a problem of dopamine? Dopamine is one of the chemicals that's implicated. So uh, dopamine malfunction, but also norepinephrine malfunction but also brain energy deficits, mm. meaning energy dysregulation in the brain. And this, I mean, this really is uh, one of the foundations of, of many mental health disorders is that the brain isn't getting a, not enough energy uh, for long enough in a stable enough way 
So the brain needs to be receiving um, a constant supply of high quality, smoothly delivered, clean energy to function properly. And there, there, there are two different ways to energize your brain. <laughs> so you can energize the brain the wrong way, which means that you're going to get peaks and valleys in, in energy delivery to the brain. You're sometimes the, you're going to have too much energy in the brain. It's in, in going to be an overdrive. Other times you're not going to have enough. So you're not going to be able to get anything done. Uh, so the regulation of energy, so the energy needs to be smooth and constant and reliable and clean. So one way you can energize your brain, because this is what concentration is all about, you know, you, your, your brain needs to have enough energy to get things done that you need to do, right? So uh, in any case, there are two ways to energize your brain. One is a very clean way, which is this, um, w you're not going to bombard it with too much sugar and vegetable oil and uh, ultra processed ingredients that will actually um, uh, cause a lot of inflammation and oxidative stress in the brain that's quite damaging and that can uh can cause the brain to malfunction or you can uh or you can deliver energy uh safely with whole foods in a way that keep your glucose and insulin levels under good control so that your brain will have the right amount of energy uh at all times 24 7 and it's properly regulated so attention regulation can be a problem in people who who don't whose energy brain energy is not properly regulated. So I have patients in my practice who've had ADHD for years and years, often decades, because many adults ADHD can persist into adulthood. It can also develop in adulthood, even in people who didn't have it when they were children. Right. So it's not always a childhood onset disorder. I have people in my practice who, when they are following a ketogenic diet, for example, which energizes the brain very differently than a high carbohydrate diet does, they don't need to take their Adderall on days when they're in ketosis. They can skip their stimulant medication or they can reduce the dose. And so you can see in clinical practice what a difference this makes. And I, I'm involved in a study that's about to be launching at Oxford University, um, led by Allie Houston. Uh, that's going to be looking at ketogenic diets for ADHD in adults. And I, there's another study that we're, uh, we're hoping will be funded in the very near future that we hope to start in 2025 at the University of Michigan with Dr. Laura Saslow, um, where we're going to be looking uh, specifically at ketogenic diets for ADHD in adults. We believe that this intervention has tremendous promise for people who are struggling with attention regulation issues. It's I, I want to talk about other diseases, but I think I just want to stay on really understanding the ketogenic diet and, and how it's having this effect. Uh, would exogenous ketones as well help with these symptoms? They can in some cases, but the problem with, so exogenous ketones for, for listeners who don't know what those are, um, well, let me back up a little bit. So a ketogenic, what a ketogenic diet does is uh, you it, it lowers your insulin levels mm. uh, to the point where your body can start to burn fat for energy, more fat for energy. So if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, you'll most of the time be running your cells on glucose, blood sugar, um, much more glucose than fat. You'll be burning more glucose than fat, so you're more, burning more carbohydrate than fat, essentially, right? So you're, you're in sugar-burning mode, for lack of a better way to say it. So if you're eating a high-carbohydrate diet, you're mostly running on glucose. Um, when you're eating a ketogenic diet, you're lowering your glucose levels by lowering your carbohydrate intake. You're lowering your insulin levels by by not just lowering your carbohydrate intake, but also being careful not to overeat protein. You're getting your insulin, your glucose and your insulin levels down. And when your insulin levels come down to this, to a certain point, fat burning will switch on. And when fat burning switches on, some of that fat will be broken down into tiny fragments called ketones. It's really just kind of um, pre, uh, it's kind of ready to use fat fragments that the brain can burn for energy. They cross the blood brain barrier very easily and they bridge any energy gaps that might be there. A lot of people, the majority of Americans and a growing number of people around the world have something called insulin resistance, which means the brain isn't getting enough insulin. 
And if the brain doesn't have enough insulin, it can't burn glucose to full capacity for energy. So the brain slowly loses its ability to burn glucose for energy at full capacity. So you start to get some energy deficits. And so to bridge that energy gap, that glucose burning gap, the, you need a supplemental fuel source, and that can be key. Ketones can cross the blood-brain barrier and bridge that energy gap and bring those sputtering cells back to full, fully energized again, um, if they haven't already died, which is we could get, get into neurodegenerative diseases later, um, Alzheimer's disease. But if the if the cells are still alive, but they're just sputtering, trying to do their best, even though they they, they don't burn glucose very well anymore, then ketones are a godsend. Because they, glucose and ketones can work together to fully energize those cells again. So this is the beauty of a ketogenic diet, um, is that the majority, the, um, 93% of Americans have some degree of insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Which means 93% of Americans, their brains aren't functioning at full capacity and need some energy support. So this is a beautiful way to solve that problem. So that's a ketogenic diet. Now, the other way you can do this is you can take exogenous ketones. You can swallow ketones from a bottle, um, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate molecules. Um, and, uh, so you'll, you'll get that spike of ketones in your bloodstream. And those ketones will cross uh, the blood brain barrier and bridge that energy gap. But, a couple of problems with that strategy. One is it's much more expensive um, because ketone supplements are expensive. Another is they only last 90 minutes, maybe two hours tops in the bloodstream. So you'd need to take them multiple times per day. Um, not everybody tolerates them well, although most people do. Um, but the really the big problem with ketone supplements is that they don't lower your glucose and insulin levels into the normal healthy range. And that's the that's what's causing all the damage in the first place. So you'll get the ketones bridging the energy gap, but underneath all that, you're still damaging the brain. You're still damaging the brain's ability to turn glucose into energy. You're still damaging the brain's architecture. You're still creating inf waves of inflammation, waves of oxidative stress, and you're worsening insulin resistance over time. So underneath those uh, ketones or would be those exogenous ketones are really just like a band-aid because underneath there's still the disease process whatever it is whether it's attention issues memory issues mood issues are are marching on so things are getting worse underneath and you're just really delaying the inevitable with exogenous ketones it's very hard though to get into a a ketogenic state I do believe. Don't you have to completely, because I've tried it once. I think I was actually measuring, I was using the, is it the keto meter? I don't know, the, the, yep. to, to actually test my ketone levels via a pinprick test. You can just do a simple blood test, keto meter, maybe it was called. Uh, to be in complete ketosis, what would that have to measure if you were using? This machine. Yeah. So what? What I really want. I, this. I'm glad you're asking this question because what I really want people to understand is that some people do need to be in ketosis long term to be well, but many people don't. Many people just need to be able to access that ketogenic state on a regular basis. They need to get their insulin levels down at least overnight when they're sleeping, which is not happening for most people. Most people are eating in a way that their insulin levels are staying high all day long between meals and even well into the night, sometimes even all the way until the next morning. And if you're insulin, if you were living your life in a high insulin state, I mean, that's the root cause of most of the chronic diseases we face. Mm. mental illnesses as well as physical illnesses, cardiovascular disease, obesity, fatty liver disease, many cancers, um, most brain illnesses, neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's disease, for example, um, uh, depression, bipolar disorder. So um, whatever disease you're worried about, chances are insulin resistance, um, the high insulin levels that will lead to insulin resistance are, are underneath our, our major driver. I've got a chapter in the book that lists all the diseases that high insulin levels will lead to. But what you're saying is so important because that low insulin state, that ketogenic, so when your insulin levels are nice and low, 
low enough that fat burning switches on. It's not just that you're burning fat for energy, which is a great thing to do, but that low insulin state is when all of the healing pathways turn on. So your, your brain and body can't recover or do maintenance or recycling work or, you know, do the, do, do all the work of cleaning up uh, after a very busy stretch of food processing. They, it, it, it's as if you were running an automobile factory and you never, you never let, the, you never shut the factory down so you could do maintenance and repair. So we are designed to function optimally by spending uh, ideally overnight, at least letting our insulin levels come down into that healing mode. And it's not just about burning fat and it's not just about, you know, it's not about weight. It's not about, it's not even about treating mental illness. It's about care and maintenance of ourselves. We need to enter that state on a regular basis, even if not all the time. 